Hello, and welcome to Business 101. I'm your professor, John Harvey. In this section, we're going to discuss the continuation of the marketing mix. We've been discussing the four P's, meaning product, price, placement, and promotion. Now, in this section, we're going to discuss promotion in more detail. We're going to go over the promotion mix. In Chapter 16, there are four pieces to the promotion that we'll be discussing. The four pieces make up what is called the promotional mix, and that is really the combination of promotional tools that you use to, uh, um, that an organization uses. So we're going to talk about each of these in detail, and the chapter is broken out in these, in these sections. Let's talk about advertising as the first part of the promotional mix. Advertising is a paid non-personal communication through the different mediums that an organization does where the sponsor is identified. And that's one of the critical pieces because if you don't identify the sponsor, that is actually the definition of propaganda. So let's go through an example that's very clearly uh, an advertisement. So as we walk through that, we can see that it was clearly Taco Bell that paid for the advertising. Uh, it wasn't personal in that it wasn't this one-on-one -on -one type of communication. It was Taco Bell communicating to a large group of people. In this case, those that are interested in losing weight. They did it through many different mediums. So this one's a commercial. However, we were watching that on YouTube, so that brings in the internet. They also invited you to go check out their website to look at um, their information. And part of that kind of leads into what I'd call the, uh, the integrated marketing communication. And that's really where you're combining all of these um, promotional strategies into one um, comprehensive advertising uh, vehicle. So the other piece is that Taco Bell is clearly identified. You know who is trying to uh, influence you to buy uh, the Taco Bell product. It's clearly Taco Bell that's doing that. Now when we look at advertising expenditures, uh, you can see here that we're breaking out TV in a couple different sections. So there's network TV, there's cable TV, and there's spot TV and syndicated TV. Um, even when we're breaking out those different segments of TV, network TV is still, and TV in general, is by far the largest dollar spend that you see for advertising. All you have to do is think about how much people are spending for a 30 second commercial during Super Bowl to realize how much money is being spent in advertising, specifically in the TV or the television uh, media. However, there's, the, there's uh, magazines, there's also local newspapers, um, there's this thing called the internet that you might be familiar with. Certain people like to do some advertising there. Um, so these are, all, these are other segments that uh, advertising um, companies will spend their advertising dollars in. What's interesting is, while I said that TV is the 800 pound gorilla, it's the largest spend, it's you know all over, it's pervasive and that's where they spend the most money. What I'd like to point out here is how uh, the internet is affecting every one of these or many of these categories. So network TV, you can now stream um, network TV through Netflix. They'll provide the, that content to you over the internet. When you're talking about magazines, that content, there's actually what are called content aggregators, such as uh, blog lines, which is uh, what the symbol is. Blog lines will allow you to 
gather that information from um, magazines and from their sites and combine it into just the content that you want to see. It's like your own personal magazine, but it's available on the internet. When you're looking at cable TV or, or network uh, TV, you have this factor of TiVo that comes into play. So TiVo allows you to skip past advertisements. This was a big concern for network TV as, and especially for cable TV where um, their revenues are garnered strictly by the, the advertising that you see there. When we're talking about local newspapers, um, we have an interesting one there where once again the internet seems to be invading that space um, very, very uh, aggressively. Craigslist came out and allowed you to put in free classifieds online and it can be in your local area. So you can go to your state and then look within that state and find your specific city or your, your county or whatever it is. And then you can list your own classifieds. And because it's so well known, um, it's actually giving local newspapers a run for the money. It's not some small website that you know few have heard of. It's actually got quite a brand name. And uh, as a result, um, it's taking a huge bite into the advertising dollars that companies are looking at in terms of if they spend in a newspaper, they spend a lot of money. If they put it on Craigslist, they get you know a lot of views as well, and it doesn't cost them, or it costs them a small amount, depending on if you're a business. And in terms of syndicated TV and, and spot TV, again, some of these kind of blend a little bit, but uh, there's a website called Hulu, which is a combination of a couple different uh, TV um, channels that have decided to combine their TV content or their programming content and make it available online. So you can go to Hulu and watch your favorite TV shows if it's on these certain networks. What's interesting about Hulu and what makes it different is, one, it's actually sponsored by the network agency or the, the TV um, channels themselves. So there's no questions about the legality or the copyright laws. The other thing is they do actually have some advertising that they put on there, but it's, it's you know, usually like three commercials for an entire episode or a, a movie. Um, so it, it's dramatically reduced the amount of advertising that, that happens there. And it just speaks to the fact that um, while we say TV has the largest spend, they recognize the huge concern here, which is people are wanting on-demand content. They're wanting to watch the shows when they want to watch them, not at the 7, 8 central or you know whatever it is that the TV demands that you have to be there. They, they want to watch it when they get off of work or you know when they're on an airplane or however it is. So... TV networks have had to adjust to that and recognize that this is a valid um, competitor for their advertising dollars. So they need to be in that uh, in that market. So those are your kind of traditional medias. There are some other ones that are worth talking about. It's worth mentioning that there's radio advertising, there's direct mail, uh, there's the yellow pages, there's billboards. Those are all what we'd call other advertising. And there's a lot that could be discussed. And again, this is one of my frustrations is that, um, you know, this chapter does a really good job of giving you overviews, but there's so much content that uh, would be interesting to go into in terms of how you, you lay out a billboard versus how you put up a, a radio spot and how you address direct mail and make that, um, make those convert rates, um, you know, beneficial for a company. There's a, a growing use of infomercials, and uh, I'll show you a slide on that and explain a little bit more later. The other thing that's interesting is product placement. Because of the scenarios that I listed out here, where you have um, TiVo, which allows you to skip commercials. You have Hulu, which allows you to reduce the amount of commercials you're going to see. You have Netflix, which may cut them out entirely, depending on the content. Um, there is a move towards companies 
to do product placements. So product placement is where you're watching some content and the actor or actress may pick up a, a can of soda. Well, what kind of soda are they drinking? And you can kind of tell by the color, the shape, the design of the package. And, you know, usually it's, you know, Coke or Pepsi or, you know, something like that. That's product placement. That's where the company that um, has this product has usually spent some money or worked some deal to have their product involved in the, um, in the content itself. And as this chart is showing, uh, it's growing, you know, at a very, very steady pace. And we'll see even more of this because of the the move of the content that uh, the content's being moved off of the network TVs and being placed in these other mediums. So, giving you some kind of uh, some points of reference here, we're talking about movies. Um, product placement has been pervasive. It's been there. Um, since pretty much TV has been around. Uh, one of the most notable ones is probably E.T. if you've ever watched the show. Um, there was an exchange between a little girl and E.T. where um, she gave him some Reese's Pieces. Now what's interesting is um, that deal for the Reese's Pieces was about a million dollars. So the company uh, Mars I believe it is that makes Reese's Pieces spent a million dollars in advertising funding that could sponsor and help the movie. So uh, what's really interesting too is that uh, that spot or that promotion, that product placement was uh, made available to M&M's first. So M&M's had the opportunity to have their product being passed from the little girl to E.T. but uh, M&M's turned it down and Reese's Pieces picked it up. So there's a little side note for you on product placement. If you've ever seen the cover of Risky Business, that's uh, one of Tom Cruise's first movies. Uh, Ray-Ban sunglasses are right there in the front. Now, once again, you saw Ray-Ban saw a dramatic increase in their, their unit sales because of their product placement. You know, he's very cool, he's got a cool thing going on, so um, those sunglasses must be cool, therefore if I want to be cool, I'm going to buy Ray-Ban sunglasses. They kind of established um, Ray-Ban, you know, in that market. So some other ones that are interesting, uh, Back to the Future has Pepsi products, um, Men in Black's got Ray-Bans in them. You can't miss uh, the, the classic ones to me were in, was in Castaway, where um, Tom Hanks clearly worked for FedEx. You knew that. Packages were FedEx packages. And uh, the, um, the, the, his friend that uh, was on the island with him was Wilson. You know, he could have been Spalding, you know, but uh, Wilson clearly was the product placement there. In TV, you know, there's a, there's a classic one, and you see this all over the place, but look at this American Idol picture. Well, guess who's drinking Coca-Cola? You know, these three smiling uh, American Idol uh, judges there. And how convenient that the, the Coke is facing in a, in a way to catch, you know, so you get a frontward picture of the Coca-Cola logo from any angle that the camera's at. So, uh, yeah, strategic product placement. And sometimes you see these, uh, and some shows are kind of almost making fun of it when they uh, just decide to do some cheesy product placement just to kind of point out that this stuff is going on. I'm seeing that more and more. Um, you know, like Superman uses Old Spice deodorant and, you know, someone will say, take my Yaris instead of just, you know, here, take my car. So, um, this is a very, uh, it's been very successful for companies to get people to notice their products. And uh, it's growing in popularity because of that advertising is getting cut out um, based on those other contents. Now, when we're talking about, uh, I mentioned earlier, infomercials. Infomercials are where a product or a company will buy a full 30 second, 30 minute um, block of television to put together their promotion about their product. So they will have 30 minutes or an hour 
to tell you all of the reasons why you should buy their product and why it's superior than the other competition. And, you know, they're really giving you a lot of detail and a lot of content about their product in the efforts that you'll make a call or order the product. So some of the most uh, large grossing or, or the ones that have made over a billion, um, you can see here. I think everyone's seen proactive on the on the TV. Um, also, the the total gym was the one that jumps out to me. That was the one with uh, Chuck Norris um, explaining that you know the total gym is keeping him in shape. So, uh, anyways, it's interesting to note that companies, when they can't put in these advertisements, these thirty second advertisements, some of them are actually now buying a full thirty minutes of television time to go over their product. Now let's talk about selling uh, in terms of personal selling. This is a, uh, a, an exciting part of the book because it's amazing how little is discussed in uh, the universities now. Uh, it's growing, it's changing, but you know in terms of advertising, in terms of marketing, uh, a lot of companies really will put these two together. They'll say, you know, sales and marketing, or marketing and sales. And we can talk about these advertising vehicles. We can talk about how you get a TV spot or a radio spot. But uh, there's some really fundamental um, steps that uh, they are worth talking about when we're looking at personal selling and how that works. Because um, as a, as a business professional, you may look at all of these chapters that we're talking about and look at what kind of career or what interests you. And we would be remiss to um, not discuss the fact that there's a large part of the business population or people that are interested in business will go into sales. And it's a, it's a legitimate function. It's, you know, businesses can't survive without it. And so it's worthwhile to um, give you kind of an overview about how to sell. So the book lists seven steps when selling uh, business to business. Bear in mind this is one business trying to um, negotiate some, um, some sale with another business. What you see here are some very uh, clear steps. The first one when we're talking about prospecting and qualifying what we're talking about there is really finding or researching potential buyers that uh, might be interested in your product. Then you do some sort of qualification, which means you're going to take that list of people and see if they have the interest or willingness to buy. So if we were talking in, in strict numbers, you'd say there may be a hundred people that want that uh, are in this group. I may prospect and find that you know, 50 of them might be candidates uh, in terms of in terms of my product or service. And then within there, I may qualify those and say, well, how many of them could actually, you know, close the deal, have the right kind of funding or have the right kind of structure? Um, and so that may narrow it down to 10. You know, so out of 100 um, potential opportunities there, you may only focus uh, you, the rest of your activities on 10 of those. So it's a, it's a pretty steep funnel. You know. So bear in mind we're talking in terms of business to business. So the pre-approach is where you as a sales professional will do a ton of research to learn about your customer. So you'll find out about their company, you'll find out their, their history, you'll find out you know, who's their, you know, who's in charge and try and find as much information uh, that you can about the company before you approach them. So this is where you'll do things like look in your um, look in the history within your company and see if you've had any activity with them before, who you had contact with. Um, you may go external and, and look and find information about them. Go to their website, look at their mission statement, get you know just get familiar with the customer before you ever approach them. Now when we're talking about the approach, um, again I, I always hesitate when I go into this stuff because there's so much content here, but um, 
some of the things to mention in the approach is that uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Uh, you'll tend to lose your audience within uh, two minutes if you're making a presentation. So your approach better be engaging. You are really trying to build a connection with your, your customer. So you really need to have a relationship there. That's part of the approach and the making the presentation. So when we move into making a presentation, this is things like you need to know your audience. You need to know the people that you're going to make the presentation to. That helps you focus your, your selling and, and what's, you know, what kind of content you're going to provide or education to, uh, to make the sale. Okay? But after you've approached them and you've made a presentation, you need to open yourself up to answering any sort of objections. Now, a good salesperson will actually already anticipate some of these objections. They'll handle some of them in their slides, but they'll leave some of them out so that they're very, um, when a customer asks, you, you, know, you can address that and just uh, make it very clear and, and be able to resolve any sort of objections. Step six is where most sales, or a lot of salespeople will think that they're done. Once they get to this point, after they've answered objectives, it's time to close the deal, seal the deal, you know, um, ABC, always be closing. And this is that point where you, you ask for them to, you know, sign on the dotted line. You ask them to, uh, you know, give you the credit card to, to transact the deal, right? Um, when you're talking business to business, Closing the sale can be a very complicated process. Uh, a lot of times there's kind of a trial close where in your presentation you're kind of moving the or suggesting that we move to this kind of close part. So you might say something like, um, when would be the best time for us to do this thing? Or um, how much would you like to put down? Or, you know, something like that. So you kind of in, you're kind of hinting at this close, and in business to business, a lot of times you know lawyers get involved, and um, you have a procurement department that has to actually make the the purchase order and, and get the pricing and all of that stuff. So in a business to business, sometimes this can be a very complex thing. If it's a smaller organization, or depending on how it's structured, it can be as much as I presented to the right people. They're the ones that made the decision after the presentation. I asked, saying, uh, you know, can I get this contract to you and can we sign this today? When you do that kind of thing, you're actually closing the sale. So that's step six. The next piece is one that we talked about in the uh, prior chapter, and that was where we're addressing the follow-up. So after the sale, you need to follow up with your customer. And this is critical because this is where you get referrals, this is where you answer um, any problems with the product, and this is where you get repeat business. So if your customer is happy with your product and you have another product to sell, you can go back to that customer again. They may have some other uh, department or some other group that might be interested in the product. You can use them as a referral. So following up with them is critical from a selling perspective. You, uh, you definitely want to address this. We talked about it in terms of cognitive dissonance in one of the prior chapters. And that's where uh, when somebody makes a purchase, and it, usually it's a large one or a fairly involved one, they'll have that kind of second guess, that, that concern that, you know, did I get the right price? Did I really get the right product? And so having a follow-up conversation, a follow-up communication with them is critical in reducing that cognitive dissonance. And once you do that, or as you do that successfully, uh, it allows or opens that door for repeat business. So there's a, an interesting video that I want to talk or show you um, that does a pretty, pretty good lighthearted um, thing about what to do and what not to do in selling. And so it's from the perspective of a business to consumer. So uh, they're talking in terms of a sales agent uh, in insurance. What I want to highlight here before we get into, this, into the video 
is that the approach from business to business is very similar when you're talking about business to consumer. When the differences are, there's not the pre-approach and the prospecting and qualifying. Think about it in terms of retail. Okay? If I'm business to business, I am dealing with the buyer at Walmart. Okay? If I'm business to consumer, I'm the person at Walmart handling the customers that come in the store. So you don't get a chance to prospect or qualify these people, um, but you do need to approach them in some way. So this is, how may I help you today? Those kind of questions. Um, if you are making a presentation, and you may not think of it in terms of a presentation, but it's really um, asking the customer questions, finding out what they need, and then delivering a solution to them. You, so the objections kind of are, are part of this answering questions and making that presentation. It's not a formal step in the business to consumer selling process, but it, it's kind of there. So then you close the sale and a good customer service is always to follow up with your customer. Now let's take a look at this video. So it's a fairly humorous video. They do a really good job of giving you kind of what do's and don'ts. And you can see how each of these steps were kind of brought into that. So um, that was pretty interesting. Now let's talk about the sales promotion area. 
when we're talking about sales promotions, <clears throat> when we're talking business to consumer, these are ones that are ones we're all familiar with. So when we're talking about coupons, hey, I know what we're talking about there. We're talking about sweepstakes, yeah, that was, you know, when you sign your name on something and enter enter to win a, you know, dream vacation or whatever. Contests, you know, catalogs, demonstrations, these are all very familiar from a business to consumer um, standpoint. And we as consumers are very familiar with these. Sampling is an interesting technique because at first, at first glance you might think that's uh, a lot of money being wasted. You know, uh, if you've ever gone into a Costco and you've seen the product samples that are out there, uh, you sit there and go, wow, you know, how many burritos are they going to go through, you know, and how, you know, that company is just going to be spending a lot of money just putting this product out there. But if you look at the, the actual numbers in terms of how much you spend to get customers or potential customers to consider your product, uh, like we said, talking about TV ads, talking about radio spots, talking about, you know, your product packaging, talking about how you communicate that your product's out there. All of these things, just to get a customer to try your product, can be very, very expensive. Sampling actually can reduce your costs because the percentage that I saw was something like 60% of the people will try a sample. So if you mail them up a sample of a product, they'll 60% of the time they'll try it. Uh, if you're in Costco, if it's a product you're semi-interested in, you'll, you'll try it. And that reduces the barrier to buying the product. They say something like 60% of the people will try samples, and of those, 80% of the people are likely or would be interested in buying the product. Now, I use Costco as an example here, but if you think about it, um, rarely do you walk down the aisle of Costco and say, I'm going to buy this, you know, 50 pound package of granola or, you know, I'm going to buy these, you know, 75 burritos, you know, packaged up in Costco. Unless you've tried it or heard from somebody or, you know, pretty much you, you had to have tried it somewhere. Either, you know, a friend, you know, gave you some or they actually had a product sample out there and you said, oh, those are actually pretty good. It, it's, a, it's amazing the convert rate, how that changes um, just by bringing in samples. And so from a, a business perspective, it can actually save you quite a bit of money to uh, offer samples instead of um, trying to do some of these other uh, techniques. Now, business-to-business -business techniques might be um, an area that you're less familiar with. The ones that jump out to me are the conventions and trade shows. So if you've ever been to a fair or uh, some, some convention, I, I use the fair example because, it, it, to me, it drives home the, the fact. If you've ever gone in and, and walked through uh, the areas where they have um, the businesses set up and they have the, the little booths, and so you walk through there, and you know, out of you know, 20 booths, maybe one of them was slightly interesting to you. You know, you up walk up and down the aisles, and you're like, uh, not interested in you know insulation, not interested in windows, not interested in you know, plumbing or clean water or, you know, whatever it is. The reason why this isn't hitting you is because it's really a technique that's better for business to business. So if I'm in the construction industry or I'm a general contractor and I walk into that area, I'm very fascinated to find out if there's some new roofing shingle process or, you know, what kind of insulation value I can get out of windows or you know, how I can set up a water filtration system in a house. I mean, those are all things that as a, as a business, I might be very interested in. But as a consumer, you're less interested. And I think uh, companies that recognize that it's really a technique for business to business um, do much better. I, I've heard, you know, businesses setting up at a, at a convention or a trade show 
and, and just going, man, you know, there's just a lot of people that walk by, but nobody was interested. You know, I just wasted my money trying to get this booth. And I think the reason why they have that is they're not recognizing that they're really, this is really designed for um, attracting other people that are in that business. One convention that might be of interest that does kind of cross over from business to consumer would be uh, CES. That's the Consumer Electronics Show. And that happens in, I think it's January or February. Usually takes place in Vegas. And it's specific to a certain industry. It's the Consumer Electronics Show. So any companies that have um, new electronic gadgets, that uh, consumers, new laptops, cell phones, PDAs, that kind of stuff. Um, this is where they go to launch or to announce their new product. Now the consumers get interested in this and they'll go to the show just to, sometimes they just want to see what's the latest and greatest, the newest. But most of the activity, even at Consumer Electronics Show, is really business to business. This is where Dell will go and announce their new laptop and then they'll be in negotiations or, or you know, talk with the uh, representative from Walmart or Target or wherever and they'll work out some, some of the uh, initial parts of that selling process. And so um, even it, when a, you have a convention that's the Consumer Electronics Show, um, it's still very much a business to business activity. I'm talking about sales promotion. We've talked about sampling. One we, thing that we didn't talk about is word of mouth. Now word of mouth is one of the most effective advertising vehicles. It's one of the most effective promotion strategies. But it's hard for business to get that because how you address your consumers and how you get them to share is a, is a very touchy subject. For starters, word of mouth generally needs to be an authentic activity. That's where if I go and watch a movie and I think the movie is fabulous and I really like it, I will go home and I'll maybe tell my you know friends about it and say, man, that show was awesome. Okay? That's where I, as an advocate, have shared with you know my friends, could be three or four different people, that the movie was awesome. Those people then have a higher propensity to go out and see the show. And if they like it, then they may share with four other people and you get this multiplication effect. Okay? So that's the basis behind word of mouth, which is I hear something is very good, somebody has mentioned it, and therefore um, I may go check it out. And it works from a, a one person sharing with many different people. So here's a little uh, video about how that works and how it relates to viral marketing.
Now, the term viral marketing is now used to describe everything from paying customers to pay to say positive things um, to setting up some sort of like multi-level um, system where uh, if you recommend um, a website or some sort of traffic to, from, uh, to your friends and they go there, you get some sort of commission check. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, a catch-all for activities. The piece that I want to draw out here briefly is that in viral marketing, uh, just like word of mouth, it can be positive or it can be negative. And when it's positive, that's where um, companies will see activity go tremendous, you know, just grow uh, out of nowhere, seemingly. Um, likewise, you can see a company that has this huge, huge problem um, when customers start spreading negative things. So viral marketing is when, you, you know, you're trying to do it on your own, you know, as a company and trying to, uh, and it, it catches on. There's a negative side, and that's uh, that's where um, public relations steps in, which will be the next piece we discuss. Now, I want to show you a, an example of a viral marketing campaign that uh, was very effective. So because of the use of Diet Coke and Mentos in that, that uh, activity there, Mentos sales went up 15 to 20 percent. The traffic on, the, on Coke.com doubled. And these guys that put this together uh, became sponsored by Coke and Mentos. And they actually began doing uh, late night TV shows where they, were, where they would put these demonstrations together. They began to travel around the, the world 
to different countries and putting these things together. Um, you can go to their blog and they actually set up some additional videos where they got you know, it was just crazy amounts of Diet Coke and Mentos just going all over the place. But because of their their activity, other people went, oh, is that real? You know, and then they went out and bought Diet Coke and Mentos. And uh, lo and behold, yeah, there, there really is a chemical reaction that happens like that. And um, so because of that activity, um, you know, Mentos just went through the roof. And uh, that, that video right there has over 11 million views. So uh, just giving you the idea there. Now, when we're talking about blogging, uh, blogging is an online diary that looks like a web page, but it's easier to create and update um, because you can post things right on it. So it's, um, it's maintained usually by individuals. However, uh, companies have their own blogs as well. It's part of uh, the social media activity, which we've discussed in previous chapters. Um, blogging is a way for individuals to express what they're interested in and share that with the world and have other people participate and interact. Uh, companies jumped on the, this as a promotion vehicle because they wanted to um, explain some of the activities that were going on and um, engage with their customers and find out um, what they were liking and not liking. So. Um, having these online um, blogs, as they're called, um, is something that uh, companies have been jumping on. Podcasting is uh, different than blogging because podcasting is very much like a, a radio program that is produced and distributed on the internet. So if you have an MP3 player or an iPod, um, you can download these programs and listen to them. Now, Sometimes there are videos, sometimes there are audio, and you know, sometimes they vary. But uh, it's an amazing way to uh, communicate content, to uh, engage with like-minded people. So there are things like um, types of blogs and podcasts are very, very niche. Um, so there are some larger ones, but really the successful ones are very niched and very focused. So it can be things like... Um, if you are starting or interested in learning how to fly and go through that, there's a podcast called uh, Barnstorming Blarney that will, um, ex where a guy is talking about all of his activities, uh, learning how to become a pilot and on each of his flights and what he did and how he, um, you know, chose his instructor and all that kind of stuff. So it can be very specific. It can be. If you're interested in how to get involved in internet marketing, um, you can subscribe to certain podcasts. You can go to different blogs and get content on niche things like um, coupons, you know, for at grocery stores, uh, things like that. So um, companies get involved with blogging and podcasting sometimes from a sponsor perspective. If these blogs and podcasts have a very strong audience and they're very specific, um, they're very niche, uh, you can get the right kind of company or the right kind of product and they'll sponsor a blog or sponsor a podcast. And uh, that can be very effective in terms of reaching out to the right audience with the right content and being in the right place. Lastly, we're going to talk about public relations. Public relations is, let me go through the steps. This is where you have somebody in the marketing area that is dealing with the public and how to relate to them. So some of the steps that they go through are to listen to the public. This is where you're listening to the podcast, you're looking at blogs, you're um, contacting people, and you're, you're getting that, that information from them. You're listening to what they like and don't like. Okay. Um, so to a large degree, this can be a free activity. This is where you, you know, you're just listening. Public relations will, and oftentimes, deal with scenarios where they'll need to change policies and procedures. And what they're really doing is informing people 
that they've done that. And so it can be very, it can be a very effective advertising um, um, activity. Um, a lot of times, though, public relations is really dealing with putting out fires. You're really trying to protect your brand because sometimes there's there's no control and there's no um, uh, you know through no fault of your own you're stuck with a, a very negative viral um, situation where um, this information is getting distributed out and it's up to the public relations department to address that and communicate to your customers and to your potential customers that uh, you know you've you've addressed this you've dealt with the policies and procedures you know and you're you're trying to ultimately let the public know that you're responsive to uh, their concerns and to their needs and their issues so um, this can be a very very tough um, tough role in marketing one you really need to believe in your product and your company and two you really need to be effective in terms of listening to public listening to the public. So I've got a couple examples here. First one I'm going to go through which is United Breaks Guitars. Uh, the situation here is um, the people in the first two windows there are actually uh, a band that was flying on United and the uh, carriers of the baggage handlers broke this guy's guitar and he spent uh, like nine months trying to work through um, the claim process with United to get you know get this remedied where they broke his guitar they should fix it you know and uh, after nine months United um, just finally closed the case and just didn't fix the problem so uh, this kind of speaks to viral marketing and it also speaks to public relations so from a public relations standpoint United really failed they didn't. They didn't uh, take this guy seriously. They didn't uh, fix his knee. You know the the issue, and as a result, um, it cost them very, um, very dearly. So I'll kind of go through, and I'll show you what his recourse after they closed his case was to put together a video. Um, since they're artists, they decided to put together a song. And so they, they wrote a song and put it to this video, and uh, here it is, United Breaks Guitars. I flew United Airlines on my way to Nebraska. The plane departed Halifax, connecting in Chicago's old pair. While on the ground, a passenger said from the seat behind me, My God, they're throwing guitars out there. The band and I exchanged a look best described as terror at the action on the tarmac and knowing whose projectiles these would be. So before I left Chicago, I alerted three employees who showed complete indifference towards me.
I've heard all your excuses, and I've chased your wild gooses, and this attitude of yours I say must go. So that, uh, that one video, which has been copied on other sites, um, has over 8 million views. The, uh, somebody over in uh, the UK, he, he got a ton of publicity off of this. Uh, it got viewed by so many people and he started getting interviews and uh, actually at one point had to fly to, um, uh, to a convention to discuss, uh, to tell his story about United. And he had to fly United, and they actually lost his bags. So, um, pretty pretty bad news for United. You know, from a PR perspective, oh my gosh, it's just a nightmare. Um, one company or one uh, newspaper um, tried to track the activity um, of when he loaded this video because he loaded it over a weekend, and by the end of the weekend, or within the first week it had over a million views and uh, as such um, they tracked the stock price of the, the company United at the time and uh, the, sh the stock price decreased by 10% um, as a result of that and they estimate that's like uh, um, you know in the millions of uh, dollars in terms of uh, capital loss there and uh, so um, Pretty dramatic uh, example here, but uh, very realistic. It, it, apparently, it happened, and uh, so from a PR perspective, United just dropped the ball and didn't um, act quickly enough to try and stop this thing, and uh, you know, remedy the situation to make it right. And as a result, um, you know, United is going to be forever linked with you know breaking guitars, and uh, that's going to be a real issue. Um, they're going to have to address or, or uh, have some sort of response to. Another one that's a little more involved is um, one that uh, is done by Greenpeace. So um, Greenpeace will produce a list of uh, largest offenders or, or you know ones that are businesses that are hurting the environment the most and um, when they produce this list, one of the one of the companies was a business that produced palm oil, and uh, as such, they were destroying rainforests apparently to produce the palm oil, and um, 
So Greenpeace had them on the list. Now most companies um, stopped using this company for their palm oil needs and, and uh, you know, found alternative sources. Uh, this also kind of brings us back to that boycott uh, discussion that we had in chapter 12 um, of, our, of our text where there's a primary and a secondary boycott. In this case, you're, you're dealing with a secondary boycott where um, um, it's not so much from a labor perspective, but what, uh, what Greenpeace is asking is that um, companies stop using this company for their sourcing of materials. Well, um, in this case, uh, the company that Nestle, made, that would, which makes Kit Kats, um, said that they couldn't do it. The, they were too um, integrated with this company and it was going to take too much time and effort and so they just didn't do it. And as a result, um, Greenpeace then began a, a campaign to uh, where they've taken the, uh, the Kit Kat logo and uh, changed it to Killer, which um, Nestle is very upset about. Um, and it's trying to deal with it from a uh, copyright and from a trademark perspective, um, which is just a just makes them look all the more worse, you know, when when companies or or people um, start, you know, defaming your your trademarks there, and uh, and then you start to try and t turn around and sue them rather than addressing the issue, just makes you as a company look. Uh, worse and worse, and so um, I won't play the whole video because it gets a little redundant. But um, Greenpeace started putting together um, commercials to address this, and uh, they're gaining in popularity. So here's one of them. So from a PR perspective, here you're having to deal with this uh, public relation issue, then it's just, um, it can be a very challenging part of your, your marketing, uh, a very challenging part of the business. Now the last part in, in marketing is a uh, kind of a general discussion, a general um, aggregation of your, your marketing how you would address it. Um, there's two sections. One that would be a, a push marketing campaign, and that's where you're trying to convince uh, wholesalers or your intermediaries to um, to move your product, to sell it, to uh, you know reach out to end consumers. And so, the way that you approach your marketing is very different. So you'll use personal selling. You know, you'll have your salesperson talk to their um, their purchasing person. And, um, you'll do uh, sales promotions trying to you know offer them incentives and that kind of activity. So all of this is where you're trying to push your product into the channel, into these intermediaries so that they will in turn uh, sell the product. So this becomes challenging when the intermediary becomes indifferent or there's a lot of competition or um, they're not really on board with uh, what it is you as a company are trying to get done. So a uh, classic example, kind of an older example was uh, the MTV network was not available on all local cable providers. And so MTV was trying to get cable providers to carry it, but um, they were having some challenges there. So they had a, a uh, what we call a pull campaign, where they uh, appealed to the end consumers, and they said, you know, they, they started the campaign and said, I want my MTV, and with that campaign, they said, you know, call your local cable operator and request to have 
uh, this channel added. And so as a result, what you're trying to do is you, you put in this heavy amount of advertising and you direct it at the consumers and then they in turn will go back to that intermediary and you know make a request. So um, you know, I want my MTV. Okay, so then I call my local cable operator and say, hey, how come we don't have MTV? And then the cable operator goes, oh, I guess you really do want that. And so um, that's a pull um, technique. So a more recent one and one that uh, will forever be remembered here is the, the movement of the prescription drug manufacturers from a push marketing technique to a pull marketing. So let me play the ad and then we'll discuss it in more detail. You know when you feel the weight of sadness. You may feel exhausted, hopeless, and anxious. Whatever you do, you feel lonely. You don't enjoy the things you once loved. Things just don't feel like they used to. These are some symptoms of depression, a serious medical condition affecting over 20 million Americans. While the cause is unknown, depression may be related to an imbalance of natural chemicals between nerve cells in the brain. Prescription Zoloft works to correct this imbalance. You just shouldn't have to feel this way anymore. Only your doctor can diagnose depression. Zoloft is not for everyone. People taking MAOIs or Pemazide shouldn't take Zoloft. Side effects may include dry mouth insomnia, sexual side effects, diarrhea, nausea, and sleepiness. Zoloft is not habit -forming. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft, the number one prescribed brand of its kind. Zoloft, when you know more about what's wrong, you can help make it right. So in this example, what you're seeing is a, <clears throat> a pull technique where the company that makes Zoloft is appealing to you as the end consumer to talk to your doctor and get that prescription. So the pharmaceutical company couldn't give you directly a, a sample of the product or try and, and make that sale, they have to go through doctors. And so that doctor was that intermediary and as such um, the pharmaceutical companies were having issues with having doctors prescribe the right uh, medications or you know, the, you know, the right amount or whatever it was. And so for one reason or another the companies decided to move to a pull technique where now you see all these advertisements for uh, pharmaceuticals and the idea is that you as a consumer are familiar with them and then you bring them up to your doctor and then the doctor will then uh, you know prescribe them and they you know the company gets the sale so um, what a uh, last little note on that is there was some senator somewhere that put in the put in a, a law that required these pharmaceutical companies to put in the disclaimer about the side effects of the these drugs and uh, as such that's why when you see these uh, pharmaceutical ads that are appealing to you as a consumer it always seems strange that they have to go through all these side effects and how they address that but it's required by law that they uh, if they're going to mention the benefits they have to mention the side effects so um, that is the difference between a push technique and a pull technique this concludes our lecture. Thank you for watching. And remember, the more you know, the more options and opportunities you have.